talking with Bonnie Erfer from Nuke Watch. Um, could you describe for us your organization? Um, Nuke Watch is a peace and justice organization that's been around since 1979. It actually started um, as a nonprofit 501c3 to help the Progressive Magazine. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the Progressive Magazine in 1979 was involved in a case with the federal government. The federal government had enjoined the magazine from printing an article called The H-Bomb Secret, How We Got It, Why We're Telling It. At that time, the Progressive Magazine was not a nonprofit, so that contributions to the magazine to help defray legal costs um, were not tax deductible. So they were looking for that tax deductible status to be able to take in bigger contributions because the bill to defend themselves against the federal government was $750,000. So um, they carried on a First Amendment battle against the federal government for about seven months. Then somebody else printed basically the same story in another publication in the country, and the federal government dropped the case because at that point it was already pointless. So then what was left was this perfectly good 501c3 organization, and Nuke Watch is a project of this organization, an educational organization. Pretty much we concentrate on ending the nuclear industry, both commercial reactors and nuclear weapons. We don't really see any difference in the outcome of either industry, so that's our primary focus. And then to sort of go back to the origins of the organization around the secrecy um, with the Progressive Magazine, the secrets of the H-bomb, we concentrate on the little known parts of the nuclear industry, the bomb making industry. One of the early projects of NukeWatch was to actually track the H-bomb trucks that carry the weapons and component parts around the country. These, and they are tractor trailers, slightly shorter than an average tractor, tractor trailer, but um, they are totally unmarked. They don't have any trucking company sign on them. They don't have any markings whatsoever. They have just DOE license plates. This is the only way that you could possibly tell them apart from any other truck on the highway. So we did a massive five-year campaign to expose these trucks that are literally traveling next to your average um, family vacationer, but it has H-bombs or its component parts inside. So um, that was one of our first major projects. And another one was mapping all of the 1,000 land-based missile silos in the country. And it literally took traveling hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles looking for them. There's seven different fields. Seven, one, two, three, four, five, six different fields in the country. Not anymore since the uh, disarmament. But um, it just took hundreds of thousands of miles to find each one and then we created maps that we put on t-shirts on postcards and there's a book that we did about the silos the history of the silos the um the uh uh sort of um struggles for power between the air force and the navy and who gets the most weaponry um the atlas the titan missile history is in it and then the maps with directions to each and every nuclear missile silo so that in fact if you wanted to see one then you could uh, just pick up a book and travel right to your favorite missile silo and one of the interesting parts of the project was that we had hundreds of volunteers from across the country who helped us to find the silos and while we had gotten really crude maps from the air force to try and find them, their maps were so bad they couldn't use them. They got lost all the time trying to find the silos. The person who actually found the silo for us got to name it. And so it has very interesting names for each of the, the sites that are in the book. So that was another project. Then we also had a lot of um, demonstrations and trespass actions at these silos and different people went off to prison and jail as a result of their activism and work against the nuclear silos. Uh, so that was another one. What we're doing now is concentrating on Project ELF, which is a Navy communication system in northern Wisconsin. It has two antennas. One is in Michigan, 
on the um, Upper Peninsula, and the other is just south of Clam Lake in Wisconsin, farther, far northern Wisconsin, an hour south of Lake Superior. And what this system does is it, it's a one-way communication system with the Navy submarines. It allows the submarines to stay deeply submerged so that they are literally undetectable by any other power on the planet. And um, ELF allows the the um, submarines to actually get a signal from the ELF system through an antenna that it trails and just stay so deep that nobody knows it's there. The submarine cannot in turn communicate with the ELF system. It is just one way. It's a first strike weapon system and it's, I do believe there is another ELF system in Australia but I don't know much about that one. In any case this system in northern Wisconsin covers communication with all tridents everywhere except in the South Pacific area and I think the Australian facility covers that area. So it generates, the, the facility itself generates um, millions of watts of electricity that are pumped into the earth into a bedrock of granite that covers, it's called the Laurentian Shield, that covers most of Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, Minnesota, and actually goes into Canada. And the electricity is pumped into the ground and arcs um, in the granite and then is forced into the, it bounces back into the atmosphere and stays between the surface of the planet and the ionosphere. These waves are 10,000 miles long. There are about 10 of them that constantly travel around the planet and penetrate into seawater. The low frequency, ELF stands for extremely low frequency, the low frequency allows it to penetrate seawater deeper than any other signals can, which is the mechanism that the submarines need to be able to pick up the signal. And so, um, We've been working against Project ELF for oh, a long time, about 20 years, and in the beginning, um, the first ideas for ELF were a project called Seafarer, and then there was another one, I forgot what the name of it was, but in any case, the Navy originally had planned to use most of the state of Wisconsin for a huge, huge antenna array that was going to literally be hundreds and hundreds of miles long to be able to do this. And there was so much opposition within the state that they had to redesign it and scale it down. And there were ballots and referendums and it was constantly defeated and there was just so much opposition to the whole thing that, uh, that it seemed at one point that surely it would be defeated and the Navy would abandon the idea, but they actually, oh, there was also a um, federal injunction by federal judge Barbara Crabb stopping the project from going forward because there actually was no environmental assessment done about what would happen with this system. So she actually did an injunction to stop it from being built and then in a higher court it was overturned saying that in the defense of the nation the uh, military could do whatever it wanted to so the project went forward and ever since that time there's been massive resistance against the entire communication system and so that's sort of the rundown on that. And is there any chance of that being shut down? Um, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, actually we're starting to plan our victory party it's been um, it's been up for budget cuts three years in a row now uh, with the defense appropriations and every year it's refunded through some sort of behind closed doors committee meetings because there's actually a lot of support to shut elf down it does seem that what's happening is that the closing of ELF is going to depend on the operations of the HARP system. There's a brand new Navy Air Force system uh, being tested and developed in Alaska, near Gaucona, Alaska. And uh, one of the first priorities of the ELF system, I mean the, the HARP system, which stands for High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project, one of the priorities by the Navy is that that, that system begin to generate ELF waves, which would then 
replace Project ELF in northern Wisconsin and Michigan. They have generated ELF waves out of the HARP project and what they're working on in conjunction with that is developing a communication system using HARP so that the tridents can communicate with the HARP system so that it would be two-way communications instead of just one-way communication so it really won't be long before they close ELF because they actually have a replacement. The, so far the Navy has not been willing at all to think about closing ELF because in fact, when the submarines are submerged, there is no communication. What they need to do is surface in order to be able to receive or send messages. And so um, they are detectable and, according to the Navy, vulnerable. And they don't want the Tridents to be in a vulnerable position. And uh, it's a first strike weapons system, so it doesn't serve their purpose. And, uh, and so ELF plays too important a part strategically for the Navy to think about actually um, cutting off communication by cutting off the Project ELF system. If HARP is running, they can close that down without any problem. What are some other things that the HARP system is capable of doing? Um, at this point, I'm, I'm not sure of what its capabilities are because they're still building and they're just beginning testing. They started testing approximately a year ago and I haven't seen any test results yet, although they did do one test that actually interfered with shortwave or ham radio operators. What they did as a result of that was to do an intentional test for the ham operators around the world to actually get them to to respond by seeing if they could read a Morse code message. So that out of the harp system they sent a Morse code message and actually got responses even before the message was finished broadcasting from ham operators all around the world saying that they've gotten this much of the message or all the message so that the Air Force and the Navy are using uh, amateur radio operators to actually test their system and the radio operators are willingly giving them the result really without knowing at all what they're engaged in as far as defense systems and um, environmentally damaging the environment you know I mean just like damaging damaging uh, the atmosphere uh, increasing the radio waves that were affected by um, actually nobody really knows what the outcome of the environmental damage from HARP is going to be. There's speculation just as there was in the beginning when the H-bombs were built or the A-bombs were built. Um, but the patents, some of the patents say that they would be able to x-ray payloads of planes traveling around the world. They would be able to create nuclear-sized explosions without radiation. They would be able to x-ray caches of weapons underground. They literally would be able to x-ray the topography. They would uh, be able to control behaviors through the zapping procedure that's been um, experimented with now for nearly 50 years, if not longer. Um, they would be able to, um, what else, do the communications with the submarines. They would be able to stop all communications on the planet. They would be able to change weather patterns. I mean, sort of the end, the list is endless because the, the wonder of the system is that it's absolutely versatile. I mean, from high frequency to low frequency to any frequency on any any band that they choose and and there's been so much well one of the differences between this system and other systems other electrical systems is that when you send a beam whether it's a laser beam or a flashlight beam or any kind of a light ray it expands as it goes out and what harp does is it brings all of the uh, emission all of the emissions basically the electrical currents to a pinpoint so that there's a really strong power point that you're dealing with and they plan on having these things that they're calling plasma mirrors which are surfaces of charged particles floating in the atmosphere that they can actually turn so that as the beam 
the single beam from this whole antenna array hits the plasma mirror, they can refract it to any direction they want to do whatever they want, depending on what sort of current and energy and uh, frequency they're using. And where can people get more information about this system? Um, there are now two books on the market. One is called Angels Don't Play This Harp by uh, Dr. Nick Begich and Gene Manning. And then there's another one, and I can't tell you the name of it because I don't remember. But it just came out a couple of months ago. I think the information is available on the Internet about it, but probably at this point in card catalogs, just under subject matter. There also is um, a harp web page put out by the Air Force and Navy and um, it actually has all of the updates of the tests that are happening and some of the results from that and the amateur radio operators responding and things like this. One of the interesting things about the entire HARP project is that in the beginning it was completely funded through the secret Pentagon budget. You know, it was just sort of put into this whole thing that's voted on every year. Yes, the Pentagon gets so much money to do whatever they want, and they don't have to tell anybody about it. And actually, anybody who sees the secret budget proposals or projects has to have very high security clearance in order to read any of the files and then simply can't talk about them. And HARP was in that bunch of files, in the secret files of the Pentagon. After the book Angels Don't Play This Harp came out, and obviously the Pentagon took a while to think about it because there was so much coverage of, of the entire harp system and the potential uses and um, just a lot of fear being generated around what the Pentagon is now doing. It's the n new age of weaponry. The nuclear industry is going to die. It has to die. They're killing themselves, if nothing else. So this is the new generation of space weapons, for the most part. It is a continuation of Star Wars. And so what happened was after the book came out, um, the Pentagon stepped back and really didn't refute too very much and obviously went through a major um, publicity revamping and, re and changed all of their ideas about the harp so that instead of hiding behind the veil of secrecy, now they're being very open about what they're doing and just simply painting a specific kind of picture about the system, saying that, well, no, we really can't do those things. Well, we don't intend to do those things. Uh, it's an old story, basically. You just take what you have and you twist it and it works for you. And um, what will they do with it? It's too early to tell. It's too early to tell simply because they're still building it. They really hope to be able to generate three gigawatts of electricity from their antenna array. And I think they've gotten to one gigawatt. So it's in the first stages of production. And um, with not too many tests yet, they seem to be going slowly with it. And, and they want to increase the antenna so that they can increase the power without really knowing what effect it will have. And what kinds of things is your group Nuke Watch doing to oppose this project? Oh, not a whole lot because it's in Alaska and it's not really close to any towns and there's no population and and so what's happening for the most part, I think what's been happening for over a year now since the book came out is that people are talking about it and letting others know that it exists. The hardest part seems to be able to get people to really believe that we have entered a new generation of thinking around weaponry uh, you know from the perspective of the Pentagon that that uh, mm, the conventional weapons aren't very much fun anymore and pretty ineffective considering nuclear weapons that nuclear weapons while they're still around are not as reliable as they really hope they are I think that most of the systems are so old and aging, especially the silos, that they, there's no guarantee that any of them work or that they won't go up and come right back down instead of actually going someplace and that the Trident is their best bet right now. So this system is very connected with that in the sense that it would be the new communication system for Trident and if it can surpass the capabilities of Tridents, if it can in fact create nuclear-sized explosions without radiation, there won't be quite the dissidents perhaps. I mean, who knows what the thinking is behind it, but in any case, 
It's difficult to get people to believe that this new generation of electronics is being used in this manner and that it's feasible and that they're capable of actually doing some of the things that they're hoping to do. Because it does sound awfully futuristic and spacey. And yet, it's there, it's running. Where did these ideas first come from? Oh, uh, there was a person by the name of Eastland. What was his first name? I don't remember his first name, but he originally worked at Arco Industries in um, Alaska. Arco owns the uh, oil and gas reserves on the North Slope, and Arco was looking for a way to use all of their great natural resources. It's not feasible to do a pipeline from the North Slope to any place because it would just simply be so expensive that it would not be beneficial or profitable to do that. So Eastland basically took on the job of developing patents to be used in Alaska that would use the resources that were owned by ARCO. Once the patents were developed, and apparently got into the hands and the minds of the Pentagon, the Pentagon simply moved in and over a short amount of time took over the project. So that the last I heard, although it may not be true anymore, Raytheon, one of the major weapons contractors, defense contractors in the nation, actually had control of the project and the patents. And it all happened through a sort of a side door where um, Raytheon lost the bid for the contract but bought all of the companies that actually won the contracts. So they ended up owning the whole ball of wax. Do you have any other comments about the work that your group has been doing? Oh, it's a, <laughs> it's a lifetime struggle of just seeing and hearing and and uh, finding out what's going on around the whole weapons complex and the nuclear industry in this country and and uh, the more one finds out and is appalled by the more work I think we just always know needs to be done so we kind of uh, recognize it as a, a lifetime commitment you know to work against at this point the nuclear industry because it does seem to be basically the most environmentally damaging and the and carries the greatest potential for such massive disasters around the world and so that's what our focus is and probably will stay until in fact the nuclear industry is gone and then there'll probably just be a whole nother thing like harp that we can focus and concentrate on in essence though um, I live within a community that's committed to nonviolence. We everybody earns non taxable income so that none of the money in the community ever goes to the Pentagon or to military spending in any way. And it's a lifetime commitment to peace and justice. So um, Nuke Watch being a part of the the lives of the community members is just sort of used in that way. It's just doing the work that needs to be done if in fact the species is going to survive. Well, thank you very much.